Well, since my early days as a postgraduate student, I focused my research attention specifically on human migration. But why? Now, I'm going to go through very briefly as an introduction the three reasons. First, personal experience. Second, pragmatism. And thirdly, intellectual reasons. Personal experience. I've been a migrant. And I don't just mean in terms of getting on an airplane and jetting across to another destination. But I left my country, Scotland, following that old migratory route to Canada, but not by plane. I don't think I could have dealt with a transition just in a matter of hours. But in the, the second last year, when migrant ships were crossing the Atlantic. And so you can see here the tender going out to the big ship that took me across the Atlantic. And in the background, you can hear the skirl of the pipes as the lone piper plays, will ye no come back again? And it was a journey of five days in which one had left an environment with which I was familiar and going to an environment that I knew nothing about. It was almost like a vacuum in which we had little courses. This is what the money looked like. Be careful of your Glaswegian sense of humor. Canadians may become upset. <laughs> I don't think you have to have been a migrant in order to understand and to study migration, but it helps. As you can see from this picture, I have been a migrant. And so that is, for me, a reality. Well, what about pragmatism? In 1960, the American sociologist Dudley Kirk, in his address to the American Sociological Society, had concluded that internal migration, in particular, was the stepchild of demography. And what he meant by that was that given relative to the attention lavished upon mortality and fertility, internal migration had been marginalized. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think in the last 55 years, uh, since Kirk made that statement, migration has been lavished with research attention. But in that time, there were, a gap existed. And so it seemed to me natural to try and fill that gap. But now, as I've said, it's a richly endowed part of research. And I think that we cannot regret that trend, but it has given rise to some problems. And one has been the reification of migration itself, an essentialization of migration into something that is more illusionary than real. And I'll try and explain that in the main part of my speech. And the last part, intellectual reasons. The father of modern migration studies is Ernst Ravenstein and his Laws of Migration that were published in 1885. But for me, more significant was a paper that was published just eight years later. The paper of Frederick Jackson Turner and his significance of the frontier in American history. Let me quote in full one of the inspirational paragraphs. Stand at the Cumberland Gap. And I should start and just explain the Cumberland Gap. Was that pass in the Appalachian Mountains that allowed the white settlers to move westwards until they had discovered the Cumberland Gap. European settlement was concentrated along the eastern seaboard. But once they discovered the Cumberland Gap, the way was open into these vast interior plains and all the way to the west coast. So stand at the Cumberland Gap and watch the procession of civilization marching single file. The buffalo following the trail to the salt springs, the Indian, the fur trader, and the hunter, the cattle raiser and the pioneer farmer, and the frontier 
has passed by. Stand at the South Pass in the Rockies a century later and see the same procession with wider intervals. Now, people don't write that way anymore, perhaps with good reason, but they don't. The fact that Turner got many, if not most, of his facts wrong, I think is beside the point. He didn't really know what to do with the railways. But what was important was the idea that economic systems move through time and across space and were associated with shifting systems of population movement. And that idea has stuck with me. And I think this is still relevant to our work today. If we do not understand the spatial and temporal context of migration, we are not going to be able to understand fully what is going on. The idea of the frontier gives us context. It brings things together. Now, while simple unilinear models have largely been left behind in recent work on migration, and often for good reason, it was refreshing to see in a recent and massive book a superb example of German scholarship by Jürgen Oesterhammer, The Transformation of the World, A Global History of the 19th Century, published just last year. The frontier was one of the key lenses that Oesterhammer uses to illustrate how the social transformation came about. And deep among the many footnotes of that massive work is this footnote that says, probably the most influential text to have been written by an American historian was Frederick Jackson Turner's The Idea of the Frontier. And you will certainly see echoes of this idea in my own interpretation of migration. OK, well, let me move on. Let me start with the basic reality. How many migrants are there in the world? Well, this is the number we use. It's the number I'm sure many of you have been told. There are 232 million international migrants in 2013. This is the gold standard. It comes from the United Nations. It's the best we've got. And we all work with them. Of people resident in a country, those defined as those who are not born in that country, but who have lived there for 12 months or more. In fact, this figure, 232 million, it doesn't bear any relationship at all to those who may or may not have lived in a country for 12 months or more. We don't know. It's just compiled from the census records of the time. And a significant proportion of that 232 million will be relatively short-term migrants. We may also have missed many short-term migrants, but nevertheless, this figure includes a, an unknown number who are short-term movers. Now, is this unimportant? Or is it important? I had a recent debate with people in the UN, and their take was, well, this isn't important. Well, I think it becomes somewhat problematic. Um, and I hope to show in this talk how important short-term mobility is becoming in the global migration system. Even more problematic is when we add to this number the famous 740 million internal migrants in 2010, a figure that was produced by the United Nations Development Programme. Now, I have many sympathies with this figure, but what does it mean? Only, it means only longer distance movements. But what about little countries like Tuvalu, um, or the Bahamas, or so on. How is there no inter internal migration there? This really means long distance interprovincial migration in China or interstate migration in India. But then if we take those two countries alone and change the definition by which we use to define internal migrants, I can come up with somewhere between 400 and 500 million for those two countries alone. One of the recurrent difficulties with the concept of migration is that we assume that it is a movement from A to B, and that's it. What I shall try to indicate is that it is much more complex and that return and onward movements have become extremely important and an integral part of movement in the 21st century. And unless we can somehow capture the complexity of the flows in the global system of migration, 
we are in great danger of distorting the reality and creating an illusion, a weak basis on which to formulate policy. Now, migration is first and foremost a demographic variable, but one about which we can make relatively few generalizations compared with the other two variables of fertility and mortality. Now let us start with the most basic of trends and what we think we know. And here, I'm sure almost every single one of you will have seen this. This is Population Studies 101. Uh, normally done in high school and we keep repeating it. The demographic transition, the transition of from societies from high fertility and mortality to low fertility and mortality. And at the same time, there is a revo another revolutionary change in where we live and associated with urbanization. So this is the basic model. But let's not be fooled. There are various pathways through this transition. But it's a macro level approach and migration is not part of the equation. So the, big, the, the, the question that intrigues many of us is whether Systematic variations in migration exist along this, tran this demographic transition. Now, a, s a significant innovation was, brought, was kind of by, brought about by a colleague of mine at the United Nations at ESCAP in the early 1980s, Bob, Bob Hannenberg, and he used small area data to plot fertility decline. Now, what I'm trying to show here is, is that here we've got let's call it period A and period B. And you can see these areas of white, the lighter areas here, is low fertility. In the second period, this area of low fertility diffuses. So in other words, the, this, this is almost a fertility frontier. And the question then is, can we plot out a migration in a similar way? Can we associate changes in the forms and composition of migration in terms of long distance and short distance, internal and international, which varies systematically across space and through time? I would contend that you can to some extent, because one of the few generalizations we can make about migration, one of the very few, is that most migrants are young adults. And so, to some extent, the number of migrants in any population must be a function of the number of young adults in that population. And you will see this fairly clearly in a, 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 a table I will show you later on. Wilbur Zielinski, in his famous 1971 paper, Hypothesis of the Mobility Transition, was among the first to examine this relationship. My own early approach, approaches only looked at mapping out systematic changes in the spatial pattern of movement itself, arguing that over time, these spatial patterns of movement evolve in particular ways conditioned by the urban hierarchy. And it was later that, once I'd established that, that I tried to link it with other developmental variables to produce what I called migration and development regions. And here is my macro-level model of uh, migration and development regions, uh, which appeared in, in that 1990 book. Um, and I'll come on to uh, 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 ideas for updating shortly. Now, what I was trying to do here was to understand transnational systems of migration at the global level. Each of these regions, and there are five of the regions here, there are five regions, but I'm only going to look at two of them because I'm going to collapse what I call the old core and the new core, core together. They are, these are, represent different pathways, but I'm going to collapse them together. And so I'll give you the characteristics of the other, of the core areas, the core extensions, the labor frontier, and the resource niche. And I think we can identify particular forms or combinations of mobility in each of these main regions. The core regions are characterized by declining internal migration and mainly intra and interurban movements. International migration is highly variable, often amongst core countries themselves, but is being overtaken by high levels of shorter term mobility. Now, I'm going to take that one region and look at it in more detail in a few minutes. And I'll try and provide the data to substantiate what I'm saying. 
If we're looking at the next region, what are the expanding cores? These are characterized by rapid urbanization with pronounced rural to urban movements and urban to urban movements up the urban hierarchy. Much international migration from the labor frontier exists to the expanding core areas. The labor frontier, the uh, third of these migration development tiers or regions, the labor frontier is characterized by some rural to urban migration within the tier, but internal migration within the region is still dominated by rural to rural movements. Significant international migration, circular and longer term to both core extensions and some core tiers exists. In the resource niche, which covers most of the area of this map, the migration is characterized by complex patterns of rural to, uh, to rural circulation. However, resistance to incorporation into the labor frontier exists, either through direct confront confrontation or by retreat. And I argue that it's in this region that we are likely to find large numbers of forcibly and displaced populations. So the mix of different types of migration, internal and international, across these four development uh, migration development regions can be presented in a tabular form. And quite clearly, I focus mostly here along the basic demography. Uh, here's your resource niche, high fertility, high mortality, your labor frontier, still high fertility, but declining mortality, rapidly expanding populations, expanding core areas, declining fertility, low mortality, and expanding labor force. And then here, core areas, low fertility, low mortality, aging, declining labor force. We can look also at an urban transition. We can look at an economic, a transition in economic activities. Quite clearly here is primarily agriculture, primary. Here it's primary. Then we're moving into secondary. But from work that we did in Korea, you can look, divide secondary up into types of, of urban um, activities. So there are different labor markets, different labor demands, and that conditions the types of migration you're likely to see. And here, of course, is the tertiary sector. Now, basic political systems have argued that there's also a transition in political uh, system. And I would argue that, by and large, in our discussions of migration and development, the political dimension has been ignored. Uh, and this is the area in which our understandings are weak. Here we've got an education transition from low levels to high levels of ter tertiary education and so on. And at the bottom, we have a gender transition. Here in the resource niche, you've got clear gender relations as you'd find in Papua New Guinea when women cannot do what men can do and vice versa to our society and core areas where women can take their place on the battlefield with uh, male soldiers. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that these transitions are going to follow each other exactly. But there are parallels. We can lay them on top of each other, and that's what I'm tr I've tried to do to generate these migration development regions. Now, there are some illusions with this map. The impression is given that the region identified are uniform, undifferentiated regions. The reality is very different. In the core regions, the key urban hierarchy and the networks of movements among the cities of the hierarchy really need to be identified, and I haven't done so. And that would be a next phase along the road. For example, we know that urban centers are the principal destinations, not just for internal migration, but for international migration. Migration is not simply to the United Kingdom. It's primarily to London and the secondary cities. Of course, we have people collecting cabbages and so on in the rural sector. But in terms of the total number of migrants to the United Kingdom, that's a very small proportion. Equally, the areas of origin, I would argue, are highly concentrated. In other words, it's not a movement from China to the United States. It's movements from very specific parts of China to very specific parts of the United States. And this really remains the elephant in the room in international migration studies. How do we identify those specific origin destination flows? And a lot remains to be done in that area. 
The impression is given in the map that the boundaries between the tiers is a nice, simple line. It's not. Outliers will exist, and parts of the outer tier will survive within the core tier. And I'll say a little bit about that in a few minutes. And thirdly, the impression might be given that the advance of the various tier frontiers is laid out in stone. Again, it is not. At times, the tiers will retreat or stabilize. However, over the long term, not only are we dead, but in a clear echo of Turner's frontier, the core tier expands outwards and the resource niche retreats as increasing parts of it are absorbed first into the labor frontier and then in an ideal endpoint into expanding core areas. All right, what about current realities? The original map was sketched to represent the world around 1990, it's be as just before uh, the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union disintegrated. In, about a year ago, Heinde Haas, my colleague, our colleague here at Maastricht, asked, invited me to update the map for a meeting in Oxford in September last year. Now, I'm not going to use the map that I came up with, as it's re still really very confusing. It confuses me more than anyone else. It's very much a work in progress, and I'm not entirely convinced that the exercise is a useful one at this stage until we manage to deal with the visualization of urban hierarchies. But nevertheless, I, have, I retain a little bit of faith in my map. It can be used as a heuristic device to identify critical points of change in the global system of migration. And here you'll see some areas circled in red. Let me just identify a few of these points. The first is that the core tier of North America, Canada and the United States, expands southwards to incorporate Mexico. What we've seen in the last 10 years, and it's not just due to the financial crisis, is the reduction in net migration in Mexico uh, from being negative to be more or less balanced. Something very interesting is going on in Mexico. It's going through a demographic transition, labor force growth is slowing, and its own economy is developing rapidly. And so we're beginning to see that stabilization. And Mexico is no longer simply a source it's now become a destination from areas further south. And just as we've seen transitioned in Europe, we're seeing one here in Mexico. I also argue that the European core area expands southwards into North Africa and eastwards into Turkey, and also the Ukraine. Although in the Ukraine, it's maybe not quite as much, uh, it's a bit slower there than in Turkey. We've seen again the transition in net migration from net emigration towards greater immigration. It began initially, of course, in the countries of Western Europe, then into the countries of Southern Europe, and now we're seeing it move into these new areas uh, on the periphery of the core areas. So the cores are expanding, uh, this core expansion in core areas in these parts of the world. I also argue that new expanding cores are beginning to emerge in parts of the periphery. Even in those areas that were once classified in this map as the, as, as the resource niche. And one of the areas I find particularly fascinating is Iran. Very low fertility, slow rate of growth in labor force, and beginning to import labor, perhaps in the form of refugees. But there's something very interesting going on here and beginning to suck in labor. I'd also argue that we're seeing nuclei of uh, new, core areas emerging in Northeast Africa and along the west coast of Africa. North, north, uh, north East Africa, in Ethiopia, and along the west coast of Africa. And we've got continued western expansion of the core on labor frontiers in China. Coastal China, not in 1990 when the map was drawn, but now is labor deficit. The labor intensive industries have moved further into China, and some offshore. So there's a lot of, of western movements, going on uh, from relative in this map uh, from here westwards into inland China. Now the map deals with principally with so-called voluntary flows. Now I have to be careful here because I know that we have a world expert, Khalid Kosa, on uh, 
uh, forced migration and refugees, because I'm often asked where forced migration fits into this schema. I hypothesize, as I hinted a few minutes ago, that this occurs most where the labor frontier is impinging upon the resource niche and incorporating peoples who feel their very survival is under threat. And I'll briefly return to that theme in a few minutes. So, the core tier. What I've been trying to say here is that within the core tier, I don't have time to look at all tiers in this, in this brief talk, but I just want to focus on the core tier. The transitions to lower migration and higher mobility. Can that really be true? Well, first of all, I want to look at declining internal migration in core countries. And then I want to look at the emerging high mobility. But in terms of international migration, I want to see a stabilization in international migration and rising mobility. Now, what kind of empirical basis do I have to make these claims? Because I hope that I have the empirical um, basis to justify all of these regions, but I'm only going to focus on the core region at present. Now, lots of numbers. Just go, this one's just to prove that you know, I do deal with population issues, lots of numbers to baffle you, but please just focus on these areas here, these two columns. These are the numbers of internal migrants in Japan. These are local, this column's local, short distance movement. These are longer distance movements. And you can see from 1970 to 2010, um, an almost a collapse in internal migration. From 4 million per annum in 1970 to 2.7 million, 2010, for the local moves, and for the longer distance move from 4.2 million to 2.3 million. The proportion of urban is growing, and it's of course associated with the decline in the population most at risk of moving. The population 20 to 34, is a fair, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a fair guess. And you can see how it's going in the future if we can believe the projections. From 22 million in 2010 to eight and a half million by 2025. Numbers of migrants are going to continue to decline, driven by its demography. Interestingly, well, let me just uh, show you here, these are the changing age profiles of Japan, and you can see by 2050. These, this is the profile of Japan. It's what demographers like to call the coffin shape of a dying population. These areas in dark here on the map are areas of severe depopulation. In other words, there's nobody left to migrate in these areas. So the interesting question is where it's whether you would substitute international migration for internal migration. But just, if we look at Korea, and I'm not going to show you the Korean figures, Korea is about 20 years after Japan, but you see exactly the same pattern evolving, except, as I say, about 20 years later. Now, at the present day, the largest migration in the world is supposedly, to believe the figures and believe interpretations, happening in China. But these are the demographic profiles for China from 2000 to 2050. And you can see the sharp decline in fertility. So I would assume that what we've seen in Japan, come 2025 and the restrictions on the, the constrictions in the age, in the age co cohorts, we are going to see declines in internal mobility in China. So will China be next? Now, but the, the, the interesting thing about Japan is that uh, the numbers of internal of international migrants has not increased, has not increased. The Japanese are doing something very interesting, declining labor force uh, and very little international migration. In fact, it's, it's actually gone down slightly over the last five years. But I'm emphasizing that demography as a, as, as, as a driver. It, demography is not all of the, the, the picture. Here is annual domestic migration rates for the United States. And we're seeing a long-term secular decline in internal migration within the United States. This is not so easy to explain in terms of demography. There's much more going on here, probably because of the increasing urbanization and decreasing differences between urban places, home ownership, changing nature of labor markets, to which I made a reference a few minutes ago, um, and so on, all need to be brought into the equation. Now, 
At the same time as this decline in internal migration has been taking place, uh, we've seen rises in uh, short-term mobility. And here comes to one of my, uh, as a population specialist, people ask, what's the population of London? What's the population of Hong Kong? And I'm, it always confuses me. How long is a piece of string? Um, and here you have one of the plans that many people don't s seem to appreciate, the difference in daytime and nighttime between weekday and weekend populations. In the developing world, dry season and wet season populations. Here you've got uh, some estimates of differences between daytime and nighttime populations. New York, a metropolitan area, um, over half a million difference. But Manhattan, Manhattan doubles its population between daytime and nighttime. If we just look at Manhattan Island, London, central parts of London, the difference between 7.9 million and 9.3 million, and Tokyo between 13.2 and 15.6. Huge daily flows. And of course, these are only part of these short-term movers, as I hope to show in a few minutes. It's obvious, but it's that in some ways, short-term mobility is substituting for internal migration. Now, I want to turn to look at international migration to the core countries. And I've been a little naughty here. Um, well, it makes it a lot easier to, to, to see. I had, uh, originally in this table, I had Australia, Canada, and the United States. But there were so many numbers eventually in the, in, in, in the table that I decided only to focus in the United, on the United States. It's the most dramatic example. But there are, what, what I'm exp uh, describing for the United States is exactly what's going on in Canada and Australia. With differences, as Mark Twain said, they rhyme. It's not exactly the same, they rhyme. But uh, uh, there are parallels rather than exact replicate the pattern. But the, the basic point is taken. This is the permanent immigration program to the United States, the largest in the world, legal migrants. And since really the mid 1990s, it's been running around with some fluctuations at around about a million people per annum. Now, what I want to do is to add two other lines to this chart in the next uh, table. And here we have the numbers we've just seen. This is these at the top. That's your permanent immigrants. Down here, temporary worker and their family admissions. Um, 1.5 million in 2001, over 3 million in 2012. Students and families, 742,000. 742, 1.7 million in 2012. This is where the action is, in non-permanent migration. As Bob Burrell, a wise old bird in Australia, told me two decades ago, he said, look, Ron, he said, if you want to st study international migration, don't look at the immigration statistics, because the action is in the non-permanent movers. Now you may say, well, of course, temporary workers and their families, agricultural workers. Well, in this three million, let me just give you the breakdown, just to be boring, a little bit of time, just be boring. 6%, 6% of that number were agricultural workers. On the other hand, 15.5% were H-1B admissions. In other words, high-tech people, primarily in, uh, Indians and Chinese, high-tech. 23.5% were intra-company transferees and their families. 24% were NAFTA professionals and close family members. And 12.7% were treaty traders, investors, and their spouses and children. That is, the vast majority of these people are skilled migrants, their spouses, and children. If we look at a city like Hong Kong, we see a remarkably similar. We see a churning in its population. Huge amount of churning. Skilled people come in, Skill go out. Within 10 years, the numbers coming in and out are about 250,000 each way in Hong Kong from the latest census data. What we are seeing is a rise in international population mobility compared with migration. We are, and I'm sorry, Stephen Castles and Hein and Mark Miller, I'm sorry, we are not in an age of migration, we're in an age of mobility. The mobility of what Leslie Sclair calls the new transnational capitalist class. Now, just before finishing this section, let me just make a few very brief observations on the patterns in the lowest tier, the resource niche, or the regions of refuge. 
Here we find mobility of a very different sort. Circular migration of groups that are initially incorporated into the labor frontier as short-term workers. However, we also find movements to avoid being incorporated into the state. These movements may result in confrontation and violence, or may, may simply be a means of escape from powerful outside powers. Part of what James Scott calls the art of not being governed. This tier is constantly under assault and is in retreat, becoming smaller over time. However, it must be pointed out that pockets, pockets of this resource niche survive after incorporation. These are aging, depopulating areas with little immigration and with relatively low levels of education that will eventually either disappear or be reinvented as recreational niche for metropolitan elites. Think Scotland, the northern part of Scotland, but there are other parts of the UK as well. During this transition, these areas tend to be intensely conservative in the electoral policies of the day. And we need interesting to look at a map of UKIP in the UK. They feel that their way of life is under threat from forces beyond their control. They have been marginalized in their own country. So I think there's a policy implication here that integration policies, which are generally designed for immigrant groups, need equally to be aimed at local population. Now, let me just uh, very quickly look at the, some illusions of migration. Perhaps the greatest illusion about migration is that it is driving the change, that migration is driving development. Yet migration is primarily the consequence of wider economic, social, and political transformations. It is an illusion that we can manage migration by simply focusing on the migration itself. The migration is essentially an indicator of wider change. And I hope my map of tiers of these migration frontiers shows how migration is responsive to those changes. The feeling that people have is that what needs to be done is to control migration, either by stemming the movements to cities, in the inter case of internal migration, or by stopping so much of the so-called south to north migration to Europe in particular. The focus tends to be on migration itself, and I think that comes from that point I initially talked about, the reification of migration. We focus on migration and try to control it. We don't look at the factors driving the migration in the first place. Now, I'm going to skip the next one out of time, but I want to come now to a, one of the uh, illusions, I think, or at least one of the, sorry, one of the realities. This reality is that is quite clearly that declining labor force. These show the population projections, 15 to 64, which is the labor force, 2010 to 2050. For Eastern Europe, you see a 30% decline. Northern Europe, interestingly, is more or less stable. Southern Europe, 22% decline. Western Europe, 10%. The United States, exceptional. The United States has managed its demography and its immigration more successfully, perhaps, more successfully. And you'll see the point I'm going to just make in a minute. Russia declining by 27%. Interestingly, China by 15%. We're already talking about China as a country of immigration. Fertility quite clearly drives this. Migration is not going to replace cohorts lost to fertility decline. But interestingly, the migrants are making a not insignificant contribution to this, to our births. In the UK, 26% of births in 2013 were to foreign-born mothers. In London, it was 57%. And that has increased from 19% in 2004. In other words, to some extent, we are offshoring or bringing on shore, we're bringing on shore our reproductive capacity. We're not likely to see fertility rise significantly amongst local populations because of that gender transition. We are going to be dependent upon migrants for our future growth. But I also hope this dynamic system of moving migration tiers has shown that any simple division between north and south is largely illusory. 
any meaningful distinction between the two becomes largely meaningless because of the constant shifting boundaries. The South is becoming the North. And to think of Singapore or Malaysia as part of the South, I think we really need to be looking at our, um, at our indicators. OK, um, it's coming to quarter past. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to shift gears a little bit um, and move from these grand generalizations and to come to some acknowledgments. Oh, sorry, yeah, let, let me this cartoon. Excuse me, I've uh, skipped a little bit. Seeing it's there, we don't always have to think about numbers of people. And the Japanese, in some ways, are automating better than anyone else. Better, is that the right word? By more than anyone else. But of course, can we automate everything? And here, from a cartoon of a recent economist, we have a robot looking after Junior with his ice cream, and we have another robot over here feeding Granny. Now, of course, this is a bit far-fetched, but uh, when we look at the Japanese situation, you can see why they are automating. They are substituting capital for labor. Okay, let me move on further to the acknowledgments. I, I've only been to one of these inaugurals at Maastricht before, and that was Hein de Haas's, and he, he stressed the acknowledgments, and I think it's very important. And it's important for two points of view. The first is generic, and the second is specific to this lecture. The first that is generic is that the person giving this, the lecture is not alone. That person reflects the ideas of all who have influenced him or her in reaching this position. May, I've mentioned many already in this talk. People like Turner, uh, Zelensky, Leslie Sclair, Hein, Kali Kosa on, on, on forced migration, and so on. However, many others have played their part and need to be recognized. Second, I can use the acknowledgements to provide an insight into migration at the personal level. In other words, to introduce some of the noise that is lost in the signal of the macro-level structural models such as the one I've presented. Perhaps two themes emerge at this messy level, serendipity and curiosity. Interestingly, in all the questionnaires I have, I have seen asking for the reasons for migrating, I don't think I've ever remember a single questionnaire having either curiosity or serendipity amongst the questions. It's almost as if we're gone back to medieval times when curiositas was a sin. It seems to be a sin in human, uh, in social science. We cannot look at serendipity or um, curiosity. Now, if we remember the folk wisdom of that great American New York Yankees baseball player, Yogi Berra, who among his many sayings, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Now, I want to acknowledge just a few of the people who have helped me take the many forks in the road on my way towards this present position. But before I do so, I want to acknowledge, uh, and this is uh, for me a very sad uh, uh, acknowledgement, uh, I want, uh, my colleague Graham Hugo, who died just a matter of a few weeks ago. And over the last 38 years, we've interacted on these, ex the precise areas that I've been discussing. We've met many, many times, we sat down over a few beers and discussed them. I'm sure Graham would not agree with everything that I've said. But my interpretations have been greatly enriched through the regular interactions with him, such as the nature of scientific discourse, and I'm going to miss him very much. Now, let me go on to the forks in the road. And I want to start with two people at the University of Toronto who used to be at the University of Toronto. The first one is Mrs. Zira Alpa, the graduate secretary. When I first went to Canada, I had no intention of going to Toronto. I wanted to go to the University of British Columbia, or Simon Fraser, or Alberta, somewhere close to the mountains. But I got re formulaic replies from those universities. 
from the University of Toronto. I got a warm, wonderful, welcoming letter. And I thought, gosh, I don't know anyone in Canada. That's where I'll go. And so it turned out that she looked after all the postgraduate students. She was a surrogate mother. When we were down, when we were writing our thesis, Mrs. Alpar raised us up. And it was very interesting that for the 50th anniversary um, celebrations at the Department of Geography, University of Toronto, almost every person who wrote in had something to say about remembering Mrs. Alpar first and foremost. Now, I also think Mrs. Alpar is, is something generic. Because in every university that I've known, there's always been a Mrs. Alpar equivalent. You know who you are. Claire Rogers at the University of Sussex, Evelyn in the break, and Susan Rogan at Maastricht. You know who you are. You are the unsung heroines of the tertiary sector, believe you me. This is my second, my second uh, acknowledgement is, an, in many ways, another generic type, your supervisor. Now, love your supervisor or hate him. He gets in your head, or more to the point, you have to get into his or her head. In my case, it was Professor Jock Galloway. He was a historical geographer of colonial Brazil, expert in sugar and in slavery. And he was supervising a thesis on contemporary Spanish America, on the impact of migration on minority communities in the Andes. We had almost nothing in common. And yet, I owe him a profound debt of gratitude because he taught me how to approach a problem logically. He taught me how to think analytically and critically. Lessons that I hope I've learned to this day, and I owe Jock an immense debt of gratitude. Now, fox in the road. Two key fox in the road here on the left, Professor Harold Brookfield. He facilitated my transition from Latin American studies to Pacific studies. Trained as a Latin Americanist, I had hopes of getting a job in Latin America. Somebody came to give a lecture at the University of Toronto who represented Peru, and at the end of the lecture he said, change of government, the job you are going to is gone. Oh, I've left, lost my job. I was depressed in the coffee room next morning and somebody threw this tiny little piece of paper at me. Job in New Guinea. What do I know about New Guinea? It sounds interesting, curiosity. And my supervisor said, look, Harold Brookfield set up the New Guinea Research Unit. Why don't you go up and have lunch, see if you can have lunch with them? So I did, and he invited me up, and I spent the day with him in Montreal. At the end, I, and he did write me a letter of reference. It was four lines long. I saw it many years later. It said, don't know much about this chap. Seems very good. I recommend him strongly for the, for the post. <laughs> and so I got from Latin American studies to Pacific studies. And the gentleman on the right is Selva Ratnam. When I was in New Guinea, I helped Selva Ratnam on a project for the UN. And when he went back to Bangkok, he did, well, there was a job in migration as a migration expert. Oh, I know Skeldon. So he facilitated my transition to 21 years of researching, and most importantly, living in Asia. So a great debt of gratitude to those two key forks in the road. Now, another couple of pe people who are extremely important, and bringing it up to date very quickly. Um, if you've been outside the United Kingdom, as I was for 33 years, your chances of getting back are almost minimal. But Professor Tony Fielding, when I wrote to him, he was, oh, he, showed, he was curious. And he opened the side door at the University of Sussex for me. Not the front door, but the side door. And I'll never, ever forget that. He gave me the opportunity at one foot in the door, and that's you should never do that with a Scotsman, put one foot in the door. And then I bumped into Professor Richard Black, who saw, oh, here's somebody who could help us with our research. And he didn't want to go up to the home office for 8.31 morning. So he said, Ron, could you go up and argue our case? He didn't want to get up that early, especially after the bonfire night in his hometown of Lewis. And so I went up, and fortunately we got the, uh, the grant and really uh, everything else is history from then because from there on I got into uh, the Sussex Migration Research Unit and the, the subsequent research which allowed me to meet the last person, the only person without a name because she doesn't need one. And that is, that is Melissa Siegel. And uh, I first met Melissa in November, I think it was, 2007, is that? I think somewhere around about there. 
Um, uh, December 2007 at a meeting in Utrecht, at which Hein was also present. And I'm sure Mis Melissa already had a plan at that stage, <laughs> but I wasn't aware of it. We next met at a meeting chaired by Khalid in Geneva in November 2011. When I, and I remember I was totally preoccupied because there's an air traffic controller's si uh, strike that night and I needed to get back to the UK and I was walking along and suddenly there was this wave of energy. And there was, there was Melissa. Um, I've got these part-time positions at Maastricht. Are you interested? And the rest, as they say, is history. But I, 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 I feel immensely privileged to be part of such a young and dynamic team. And thanks to all of you who've given me the opportunity to learn new things about parts of the world I knew little about. And the last slide, the, the last acknowledgement, is of course, it, migration is a demographic variable. I keep emphasizing this. Migration, fertility, mortality. But there's an intervening uh, variable here. And that's nuptiality. And of course, the last and greatest debt of gratitude is to my partner, spouse, wife of 42 years and running. Uh, she has accompanied me at all our, our, our many migrations. Sometimes I've been the trailing spouse, sometimes she's been the trailing spouse. But to her, I owe the greatest debt. And so do you. Any of you who've read any of my papers owe her a debt because she is an editor. And so any ease that you might have felt in reading my scripts have been due entirely to her. So, Mr. Chairman, I know, I thought I had an hour, but I know I've just almost run out of time. What have I tried to do in this lecture? And I think the following points can be extracted. First of all, the need to improve the basic measures of our reality and to improve, improve our understanding of what the numbers mean. We still have a long way to go. In this regard. Secondly, the need to place our studies of migration in a broad framework that provides us with a context in which, in which specific migrations are occurring. The time and space approach gives one example of such a framework. The emphasis on a framework should cause us to broaden the focus of our work. I feel that there has been too great a concentration on the narrow and we are in danger of losing sight of what the really big issues are. Let us heed the words of the great American sociologist, Charles Tilley, and not, not be afraid of big structures, large processes, and huge comparisons. This, needs to, this means that we need to move away from a focus on migration itself towards the factors that generate the migration in the first place. And quite clearly, what I've tried to uh, emphasize, fifthly, is that we need to move away with a preoccupation about longer-term movements to incorporate shorter-term movements. Let me end on a final enigmatic note. Although the realities about migration in terms of the numbers might be illusory more than anything else, we need to avoid the illusions about migration becoming the reality. So, danke viel für het Leisteren. I hope that you had leuk fond. Thank you very much, Ron. This was a, a great lecture, and I think it is also. Uh, Fitting, as I mentioned to you before, I will write a little note to my colleague in Sussex, uh, the Vice Chancellor there, to indicate that we are migrating them, some of their professors to Maastricht here. And as an alumni of Sussex, I'm sure he will be very pleased. I don't know. I, I assume that he will be very surprised to hear this. By the way, we tried to do this once because I had a predecessor here where we did this also, and this was... Uh, Chris Freeman, whom we also appointed here as uh, professor, but unfortunately he, I never could convince him to give his inaugural lecture. And so thank you for doing so, and thank you also for highlighting the whole issue about the geographical dimensions of migration, which I think is very much needed, and the way you put it forward in terms of the importance of urbanization as part of migration, and the way, of course, we 
ourselves in terms, and I'm sure Melissa too, in terms of experiences with migration, being part of this new transnational capitalist class um, is certainly an element we should also reflect on. Let me congratulate, of course, first and foremost, the Dean of the School of Governance with this new professorship. Let me also look forward to the further work on migration as it is blossoming across different faculties, the Faculty of Law, Faculty of Fasos, of Arts and Social Studies, and of course, within the framework of ITEM and Maximite. I very much look forward to further research on migration at this university here on the border of different European countries. So thank you very much, Professor Skelton, for this inaugural lecture. And may I now invite all of you to congratulate Professor Skelton in the Refter, where there will be a short reception. I close this session. Thank you.